Welcome. Give everyone just a second to get connected and get their audio on. So welcome everybody, good afternoon, early evening. Um, thank you so much for joining Book Hampton's virtual event with Scott Mitchell and Lynn Winter. Um, They're in conversation today with Paul Goldberger. A few Zoom housekeeping details before we get started. You are all muted and you will remain muted through the duration of this event. For optimal viewing, um, use Zoom view functions in the top right corner um, of your screen and select speaker view so that our author um, is highlighted on your screen. Please ask questions in the chat box function of your Zoom screen. We will get to as many questions as possible. Book Hampton's mission control, that's me, um, is monitoring the, uh, the chat box. So send your questions there. Um, if at any time you drop off the Zoom or experience technical difficulties, simply click the link again to be readmitted. And please don't forget to purchase a copy of Scott Mitchell's Houses at bookhampton.com um, or at rjjulia.com. I will leave links in the uh, Zoom chat. And now without further ado, let's get started. Scott Mitchell is an acclaimed architectural designer he is celebrated for his warm, modernist approach to connecting the built and natural environment. Houses is the first volume that spotlights his work, uh, featuring previously unpublished photographs of some of Scott's pivotal projects. Lynn Winter is the founder and president of Lynn Winter Inc., a strategic communications and advisory agency specializing in contemporary art and visual culture. She is also Scott's editor, collaborating with him on his debut monograph. In conversation with Scott and Lynn this afternoon is Pulitzer Prize winning architecture critic, Paul Goldberger. And now I will leave, leave the chat and open up the floor to Scott, Lynn, and Paul. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks very much, Catherine. And thank you both Scott and Lynn for uh, being here from Los Angeles today. Uh, I'll tell you, one of while virtual events are frustrating in some ways, they also are a wonderful opportunity in others, because uh, we get to have people from all over the country and all over the world joining together, uh, who might not be in the neighborhood to show up at the bookstore. So, uh, and on balance, I think we come out come out very very much ahead. Uh, this is an exceptionally beautiful book, and I, I'm actually going to hold up my copy. Um, which, not the least of the reasons I like it, besides the fact that I very much like Scott's work, um, is that it's so wonderful to have a, an elaborate book about very meticulously designed houses that has a black and white cover, which strikes me as sort of a perfect symbol of the, the understatement that Scott's work has. It's, it's, uh, not simple work, it's not plain work, uh, but it's nevertheless beautifully restrained and, and controlled and disciplined. Um, let, let's start by talking just about the background, Scott, and how, how, you, how you developed the aesthetic that uh, uh, marks not only the cover of the book, but really more importantly, the work within it. Yeah. Um... Well, I, I jokingly said to Lynn, Lynn, Lynn started working with me uh, about seven or eight years ago, and, and she was gung-ho to get started, and, and we, we've talked about this book for so many years, and, and she said, all right, when, when are we going to do the book? And I said, oh, g give me another seven or eight years, because in architecture, of course, uh, everything happens at, at a very slow pace. And in so, book publishing, everything also happens at a very slow pace. Yeah, and you compound the two together and, you know, right. it's interminable. So right. uh, at, at 49 and a half years of age, I finally got enough stuff to, uh, to, to, to fill a book. Um, it, it's a long, a long road, but uh, also hopefully a graceful profession to grow old in, I'm, I'm hoping. But uh, my work is, is kind of informed, I think, 
largely as, as for all of us, um, you know, our experiences in life shape and kind of direct our path and our journey. And I, I think my aesthetic and my um, style of architecture was really influenced by the unique way that I grew up. My, my dad was a fighter pilot in the Air Force and, uh, and the military attache to the U.S. Embassy in Amman, Jordan. And so I lived as a kid in Jordan and in, in Japan for four and a half years. And it was um, really interesting to, to see, I think, the, the Middle East part. You know, my, my folks were so good about taking my sister and I to ruins on the weekends and we'd mm -hmm. have little hikes and picnics and you know in the middle east you, you can't throw a baseball without hitting something five thousand years old and there's something about the way ruins er erode into the landscape uh that there, there's something poetic in that they, they just got in my dna i think as a kid and it, there's something really romantic to me about the idea that um, something man builds can sort of be retaken by nature over time. And so a lot of the monolithic elements in my work, you'll see big concrete walls that are three and a half feet thick and masonry. I think it kind of draws from that. I think it was influenced by that early on. And then, um, and then I also really have a profound appreciation for wood and light, delicate, um, use of materials, which I think was something that I picked up on with the Shinto architecture in Japan. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how I, I guess it got in my blood um, and, and led me to where we are. But there's also a lot of the modernist architecture tradition, mm. which is important to your work, it seems to me, but not in an orthodox way or not in a dogmatic way. Um, yeah. It, and it's woven together with other things. I mean, I, I think I've said to you before, one of the things I like best about it is that it seems both modern and connected to history at the same time. Uh, it, the, 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 the sense that those two things are incompatible is not compatible with your way of looking at things, it seems. Right, right. Yeah, you, you and I have spoken before about this interesting conundrum that we face in architecture today because, you know, modernism uh, has been around since the early, early 20th century. So right. it's more than a hundred years old. And so by definition, modernity in architecture is antique, which is, you know, quite a, a paradox. Right, right, and right, so right. I've kind of come to the conclusion pedantically when I hear clients or people talking about architecture, they, they always want to use two terms, modern or traditional. Right. And I think what people really mean by that, I, this is my own observation, is e either pitched roof or flat roof. Pitched roof is traditional and flat roof is modern. And so we kind of find ourselves at an interesting crossroads, I think, in terms of uh, anything goes, you know, the, the, the rule book on modern and traditional, the lines are very blurred now in a way that I think is pretty great. Um, yes. Well, the, it, it's great if you can do work that synthesizes it as beautifully as a lot of your houses do, I think. Uh, it also creates, there's a certain amount of confused, crappy work, but there always has been. So that, that, that's, um, uh, now let's go back to your, the history of your career. It's kind of interesting. You, you talked about growing up all around the world and about exposure to a lot of different kinds of culture. Um, what was your exposure to modern architecture, though, which was not part of that upbringing? Uh, I know you spent a little bit of your early career working in Eastern Long Island, even though you spent most of it in L.A. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I have to confess, as a kid, I didn't really know what an architect was. Uh, and I started off my, an undergrad, at, actually in pre-med. And, and I think I, I was driven out eventually by the the the... the the pain of biochemistry, but uh -huh. um, but I, I went over to the College of Architecture and enrolled, and it just felt really like the right decision for me. And so, 
uh, ever since that second semester of my freshman year, I was kind of on this trajectory to become an architect and really enjoyed it and have felt, you know, right at home in, in that space. Um, but I don't know how I really came to discover it. It makes sense looking back. I played with Legos a lot as a kid, uh, you know, <laughs> but uh, I don't know where, where the spark really, what, what the genesis of it really right, was. Right, 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 right. Um, but then when you actually got your degree and began your career yeah. you around a certain amount and were exposed to several people who were really key mentors, right? That's right. Yes. I, I had a fabulous uh, experience as a young um, architect. W one of my first internships uh, was on Long Island in, in the Hamptons, and I worked for Preston Phillips, right. uh, who was a fabulous architect, um, modernist, uh, that had come out of uh, uh, Paul Rudolph's office. Mm -hmm. It was one of Paul Rudolph's protégés. And, and Preston created this warm bath of an experience as a, as a young man because uh, it was such a small office and, and I was able to really learn a lot about the different facets. It's not like a, if you go to work for a big firm just out of undergrad, you know, you might get stuck doing window details. For I was about to say, you learn, you learn how to do doorknobs endlessly. Uh, exactly, yeah. exactly. So it was quite the opposite of that. And, and uh, I had a very brief um, stint. Nor Norman Foster offered me an internship in London. So I moved to London for a few months, actually before moving to uh, uh, Los Angeles. And uh, Well, Norman Foster and Rudolph had a connection as well. So again, it's interesting because I really do see a little bit of a faint echo of Paul Rudolph in your work too. I mean, the yeah, that's interesting. That sense of, of some very distant connection to Frank Lloyd Wright, but not direct and a sense of just sort of composition being such a key part of your work as it was for Rudolph, who, who was so magnificent at simply composing elements and placing objects within space. Um, yeah. That's something I very much feel in, in a lot of your, your houses. Um, and the fact that both Preston Phillips and Norman Foster were very influenced by Rudolph means there's a kind of, uh, somewhere the DNA. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. So yeah. what took you to Los Angeles? I, I wanted to go back to, to grad school and uh, I had been out for four or five years in between undergrad and graduate school. And I was in between uh, the, the Architectural Association in London and, right. and Arc, Southern California Institute of Architecture here in Los Angeles. And I decided uh, I, decided I wanted to go to SciArc. And, and so I moved to Los Angeles in, I think, 1999 and, um, and started uh, graduate studies there. And then just kind of stayed on in Los Angeles and, right. um, and, and started to get hired to do jobs. And, right. um, and, and so uh, lovingly, I am stuck in Los Angeles and actually feel very happy to be here. It's such a good sure. time. Well, it's, it's in, the, in the years that you've been there, it's become you know, an architectural community of enormous vibrancy and importance, actually really before you came, but it's, it's been yeah. more and more so and continues continues to grow in significance, it seems. Um, but now, I think one of, one of your important influences was somebody who was not an architect, but passionate and knowledgeable about design, which is Sandy Gallen. Yeah. Talk about that a little bit, and, and that can bring us back to the Hamptons and, and the work you've done here with him, as well as in California. Yeah, so but my book is actually dedicated to, to Sandy, uh, who we lost, and then, and, and the book's also dedicated to my son, Max, uh, who, who came along just a matter of weeks after Sandy passed away. Mm -hmm. And Sandy was my best friend and, and uh, well, a very, a very um, prominent sort of force in my life in terms of experience. I met Sandy when I was in the Hamptons, on, on the beach in East Hampton, and Sandy, had uh, a passion for interior design and, and design environments and, and creating these ambient, uh, ambiances that were great for party throwing. And I mean, he's just kind of a legendary character. He really was never formally trained in the design uh, world. He, he was a Hollywood guy. 
And right. he, was, he was a manager of talent. One of the sort of great amateur designers around, right? Exactly. Yeah. And, to, and really kind of a taste influencer. He, he would do these houses. And even though he had managed the careers of Michael Jackson, Dolly Parton, Barbara Streisand, Bette Midler, just tons of people, uh, even though that was really his, his, his career trajectory, at the same time along the way, he would do these houses for himself and then turn around, sell them, furnished, soup to nuts, and would kind of move on and do the next one. Right. And I, I remember once asking him, sort of, sort of in a state of frustration, really, because we had just finished one and he, and he was preparing to sell it already. I said, Sandy, how can, you, how can you part with this? I mean, you know, and he said, Scott, I, I got to tell you something. The truth is, it really, it, it's really like an addiction I have buying all these beautiful antiques and these beautiful things. And so being able to kind of sell it and move on in a way validates my addiction and it lets me kind of keep on and just do another one cre creatively. So really it was the creative process that I think turned him on. And, and, and I, I was at the, the, the receiving end of, of that as a young person. And, and Sandy's interest was really interior design. He was a right. brilliant decorator, brilliant. And, and I really was coming at it from more of an architectural perspective. And so we collaborated and, and he hired me to do nine houses for him. Mm -hmm. And so I, I was uh, hired a, a, by him to function as an architect for nine projects. Right. And during that time, we, um, you know, developed a very close friendship and, um, and, and Sandy was an extraordinary sort of on, you know, door opener for, mm -hmm. for many of us. And, and so I kind of met a lot of the world's glitterati through, through Sandy. I wouldn't have met them otherwise. And, um, and so he was a really important kind of part of the path. Sure, sure, sure. Um, but, and you really collaborated on some of the most important work in the book, right? Um, yeah, yeah. The, the, the two farm projects that are in the, in the Hamptons, uh, not, not far from Bookhampton and not far. Right. Well, one of them is right around the corner from my house. I've been looking lovingly at it all the time that you were doing it and now that it's finished. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, and that was the last house Sandy lived in, right? Yes. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And um, so, uh, yeah, that was kind of a rich, a rich part of it and several projects in the book. But, but I think perhaps most importantly is the, la is the lasting sort of imprint on my DNA in terms of the interiors. I, I think, Paul, that um, what makes a really great project, and I'm sure you will agree with me, it's, it's the synthesis of not just the building, but also its contents and also the gardens. You yep. know, they all really want to be in symphony uh, with each other. And so Sandy Gallen really um, emboldened my appreciation for the interiors part. You, you feel that very much in this book, which is, um, uh, well, let, let, let me ask Lynn to tell us a little bit about how the book came to be, because it is, it interests me in, primarily because Scott's work interests me, but also because it's a different take on the monograph. It mm -hmm. really pulls you into the aesthetic more than most monographs do, um, with an enormous number of pictures. And some of them are not standard kind of pictures. They may be close up details. Uh, text is not the dominant thing. Maybe I shouldn't say that as a writer, but nevertheless, text is not a dominant, the dominant thing. It has that wonderful restrained black and white cover I mentioned earlier. Uh, I mean, it's an unusual book in that way. Can you talk about how it came to be and took this form? Yeah, absolutely. So I met Scott in 2013 at the Malibu House, which if, if you've seen the book is um, one of the eight chapters. 
Yeah. And it's a magnificent property um, looking over the ocean. And it was the year that he just completed the design for Nobu Malibu, which I think was an influence, you know, very much so right, for this right, Malibu right. property. And, you know, at the time, we talked about, you know, whether at some point we'd be able to do a book. And, you know, Scott explained to me that it was a very slow moving profession and that, you know, may have to wait a decade for enough, you know, well, projects. Well, as I said, so is publishing. So yes, yeah, but it was a very, it was a long journey. And, you know, there were a number of projects in the works when we met. And I would say two and a half years ago, we sat down together and it became clear that there was a significant body of work and there were relationships and themes and ideas that ran between early projects and more recent projects. And, you know, it seemed to be the moment professionally for Scott to do the book, but equally there were personal reasons that I think came about, you know, with regard to losing Sandy, his son being born, and there was a sort of a, you know, a feeling of a sort of new era, one era ending and a new one beginning. Mm -hmm. So the book traces really a 20 year period from Scott setting up his studio, completing a number of projects, eight of which are in the book, and they span East Coast, West Coast of the US, and an Australian project, and others in LA as well. And so it seemed to be the moment. And one of the things that I have found very interesting in Scott's work is his attention to material and form. And so what was very important when we decided to do the book was that it would really become an object, almost an object that would be a part of the buildings. And that's really, you know, why I think it, 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 the end result is so beautiful. I mean, we, we took, I mean, Scott will tell you a little bit more, but we really went to great extent with um, colors and textures and every single thing in the book and working with a great designer as well. Yeah, yeah. That, that was very much my sense of this book, that it, it really comes closer than most books I've seen to trying to use the form of a book to replicate the experience of actually being in one of these houses. Um, it, it is less a narrative about Scott's career. In fact, actually, I've learned a couple of things in this conversation that aren't even in, aren't in the book and that, that we don't, it's, you know, there's, it, this is not a book that says I did this and then I did this and then I did that. It's a book in which the work really does speak for itself. And you feel through uh, very, very sensual photography, some of the feeling of actually being in these spaces, which is an unusual achievement in this kind of book, uh, uh, I, I think. You know, and I, I, I have said a couple of times, I think that, that Scott's work is much more about feeling and experience than it is about any architectural dogma or theory. And the book follows that, it seems to me. The book itself is also about feeling and experience rather than a particular narrative story. Uh, I mean, I have to say that the choice, Paul, of photographer was, or photographers was very important to all of us working on this. And, you know, I think that you, we found an extraordinary photographer in, in Melbourne, Trevor Mine, who did, um, you know, quite a few projects, has a beautiful sensibility and just really yeah. captured, you know, Scott's kind of, you know, creative vision and aesthetic. And obviously, yep. Yep. you know, Scott Francis has documented a number of projects. Yep. And then we even invited Ross Blechner to take some photographs of the Hamptons projects. And he's obviously... Mm -hmm you know, familiar with um, the projects, but brings really a sort of artistic sensibility to, 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 to the work. You did not choose to include floor plans, which is somewhat unusual for an architecture book. Um, and maybe that's as a, uh, that might be the only issue I might disagree with you on. In that oh, really? I, I learned, you learned so much from a floor plan. Yeah. Why was that? You know, the, 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 the real reason is a lot of our clients are, they were so gracious to let us publish 
the images yes. and 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 but so many of them are really uh very private right and and so there were some concerns with with you know the their floor plans being published and sort of broadcast to the world for security oh, okay. reasons and that kind of thing but um but i i really appreciate it. everyone kind of stepped up to the plate and let me publish their work and i'm so profoundly appreciative because you know without photographic record of the work it's like it never happened right you know some especially with houses because they're 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 for private use and so um well, and today it gets harder and harder people are more and more anxious about security and issues like that and i know certainly there are many houses designed by distinguished architects for very prominent clients that never get published, that never get into books, that never get into magazines and so forth. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, that, that was uh, really the reason for the, for the lack of plans. Sure, sure. So, um, yeah. But I, I mean, it, it, it's, on the other hand, it, it also, as I said, the photography and the design go much farther than most books into actually really allowing you to vicariously experience the house. Yeah, Paul, that, that's such a, I, I'm so pleased that you made that comment and that observation. That, that, that is, you, don't, you may not know it, but that's the biggest compliment you could, oh, well, you could give. Good. Because the, we, we talked about this, you know, we, we said, the, the, the problem with photographing architecture, as you well know, is that right. ar architecture is so experiential. It's about you go in and you have to turn your head and it's, it's like, it's like music, it's processional, there's progression through right. it. Right, you, you move through it in, in time, in real time. Yeah, exactly. And also, and light, and all those things, yes. All those things, and, and the, emo the emotive experience that comes from all of that. And, and so, to capture that in fixed images, first of all, is a, is a big challenge, you know? It's very hard to do. I have a lot of respect for very good architectural photographers. Right, right, right. And, and so, we, we wanted to tell the story, and we worked with this brilliant, a uh, young woman named Mimi Tang, who, who I just can't envision ever not working with. I think she's a total talent graphically. She really helped us steer the book and, and, and understood what we were trying to do. But we wanted to tell a narrative um, that felt experiential. And we talked about the book being, let, let's, not, let's not just look at this like it's a book. Let's look at it like it's a, like it's a project, like it's an architectural project. Mm -hmm. And so I'm thrilled that you, that you made that comment and that observation. That means a lot to me because we, we did attempt to do that. Well, your work is very, um, very sensual. I mean, you know, it is about feeling and, and experience and the texture of materials and about solids and voids and spaces and light and all the things that good architecture is supposed to be about, actually, ideally. Uh, but many architecture books essentially expect you to take that on say so and don't actually themselves as objects make you experience it. So, mm. Let me ask you a, a shift slightly. Um, Nobu is a rare exception for you in that it's a public space, a, co a restaurant, a, a commercial project. Um, how much have you done that is not residential? Uh, the book is, of course, exclusively residences. Uh, and do you want to do more, or do you want do you envision your practice going forward as sticking with residences and ha houses? Yeah, great question. Uh, I, I, I jokingly say I would design a bird a, a bird house or a gas station if somebody hired me. Okay, you know, with open arms because it's a different program. So. Right. You know, as we get older, you know, it kind of keeps things more interesting when you have right. different programs to work with. Right. So uh, Nobu and Soho House, the, the building adjacent to it, were, were, were the only two restaurant type uh, buildings I did. The, the, what's now Soho House in Malibu was actually a, a restaurant for, it was designed for Wolfgang Puck. It was going to be a restaurant for Wolfgang. And he and I spent a year together, you know, meeting every couple of weeks and, 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 and he, he, he kind of got cold feet at, at, at the end of the process and pulled out as the tenant. Uh, Larry Ellison is like the landlord, so to right. speak, and owns those properties. And so he, I was working for Larry, but, but doing a, 
uh, a restaurant building for Wolfgang and for, and for a sushi restaurant. Right. And the interesting thing is no, Nobu, Mayor Tepper, who, who runs Nobu, didn't want to move across the street. He was in uh, the Cross Creek Shopping Center. Mm -hmm. and, and this gorgeous guy named Richie Notar, who I just adore, uh, used to be the managing partner of Nobu. And I had known him through Sandy for years in New York City. And I called Richie and I said, Richie, you got to talk to Mayor and convince him to move into Larry's building. Because right. if you don't, Larry's told me he's going to send me to Kyoto to hire the fanciest, best sushi chefs in the world. And it's going to put you out of business in Malibu. And so he finally came over. And, you know, now, of course, it's like the number one grossing restaurant in America. And Mayor Tepper thinks it's the best idea he ever had. Right, 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 of course. <laughs> But, uh, but anyway, it, so we did that and I, and I helped a little bit my dear friend, um, Peter Liu in Australia. The, the Australian house in the book uh, uh, is, is a, a house I did with, um, w with a family in Australia and I became very close with uh, Peter Liu. And, and so I helped him with some shops. He owned Seed in, uh, in, in Australia, which is a lifestyle brand, not unlike Ralph Lauren. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I had a really enjoyable experience in the retail sector, working with Peter uh, on, on sort of brand uh, ID through architecture with Seed. And then I'm now doing for the first time a medical building, a five story hospital, private hospital here in LA, which is a super compelling exciting wow. project for me because hospitals are the most depressing. Uh, you know, if you're not sick, when you go in a hospital, you're sick after you get in there because it's so, you know. Yeah, yeah, totally. You know, you've anticipated what was going to be my next question, which was as somebody who at one point toyed with becoming a doctor, have you ever been interested in designing a healthcare facility or medical facility? Yeah, I, you know, for a long time, it's like, you know, every time you go to visit a loved one in the hospital, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah the lighting and, you know, it's, it makes you look green and, you know, it's just terrible. And I'm talking, you know, nice hospitals, the nicest hospitals even. Yep. And, and, and so the healthcare system, healthcare architecture, which is really um, governed by Oshpat, uh, for, for obvious reasons, it's got to be highly regulated because, you know, right. bacteria can't live on surfaces and stuff. But, but it, it's actually, there's, there's more room to wiggle than you'd think in terms of lighting color and in, in terms of creating spaces that feel more residential and warmer. So mm -hmm. um, I look forward to showing you, next time I see you, I'll show you some images of what we're doing. I'm really excited about that. Mm-hmm. Kind of redefining the paradigm on on medical hospital space where it's not so depressing and that that's a that's a challenge that so far has defeated many many good architects I know, I know i know who have been brought in right i mean i am paid did a whole wing of mount sinai hospital in new york many years ago and i get it's better than the old wings of it but it's still yeah. not what you would hope for at all yeah. I know, I know, I know. So we're we're really we're really dedicated to trying to to do something that that makes a difference. So we'll we'll see. That, it's a private that, hospital. It's not public, so uh, it's owned by the doctors. Uh, okay, so you're not. This is not like a new version of Cedar Sinai that you're doing. Okay. Right, right. It's a it's a private uh, hospital for. There's a group of, of three or four doctors that are putting it together, uh, who are all kind of experts in their field. And, and it'll be a private kind of high-end hospital and, and they, they very much want to have it feel like a uh, hospitality sort of environment and experience rather than a, you know, strictly medical experience. So, so it's more a, like Nobu than... Uh, yeah. More like Nobu than Cedar sinai is the goal. Yeah, exactly. Right. Okay. Exactly. Uh, where's it going to be? Uh, it's, it's near San Vicente and Wilshire in, uh -huh. in LA. Yeah. Great, great, good, good, wonderful. Um, yeah. What about on the East Coast? Is there anything else? Now that you've done two projects with Sandy in the Hamptons, is there any anything else in the East? Yes, I'm doing, uh, I'm working on some projects in Miami at the moment, residential and, 
and it looks like I'm about to start a project, I'm happy to say, in, in, out in the Hamptons in North Haven for a really lovely couple. Oh, wonderful. Uh, Great. Yeah, so that'll be a good excuse to spend time, you know, in the Hamptons that I love so much. And of course, our, our, our beloved friends, uh, Paul, Clifford, and right. uh, Nikki Donan that, that uh, we can't forget about, um, who, who uh, live in the Hamptons. I'm helping Clifford with a little studio space. And so, That's great. Uh, That's yeah, great. yeah. That's wonderful. Um, and the, um, the Amagansett Farm was, I know, purchased recently. Is that in the hands of people who are taking good care of it as well? Yes, yeah, that, that, uh, I, that, that property, which I love so much, it was one of my first projects. Uh, I did it 21 years ago. And, mm -hmm. and it's like, you know, you're getting old when you, you, you go to look at a house that you did 21 years ago. And of course, all I can see are the things I would do differently. Right, now. right, 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 right. But, uh, but it was bought by this absolutely lovely couple. And I'm, I feel like it sort of returned to the family. It's so hard good. sometimes when the clients sell these things. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Good, 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 good. We have yeah. some questions here. And let me ask uh, everyone else or anyone else who wants to submit one, please do send it in the, uh, through the chat channel and uh, we'll, we'll share it with Scott and Lynn. Um, let me start with this one. Um, Scott, which project that you've done um, was the biggest surprise where the final concept was very different from the initial concept and, and what caused the, the changes? Um, Great question. Probably there, there, there was a project that's not in the book that uh, was a beautiful, um, smaller Paul Williams house. Mm -hmm. Paul Williams, for, for those of you who don't know, is one of the great LA architects. And, and very early on, he was um, an influential uh, architect in the 30s in, in LA and, and, and was actually one of the first prominent black architects. Right, right. Uh, and and leaves a really rich, fabulous legacy for you know all the generations that have followed here in LA, which by the way you know sort of lacks a historical precedent because it's so new compared to the East Coast and certainly Europe. Um, and so Paul Williams was this fabulous architect, and, and we were hired to do a house, and the client wanted it. It, it was a smaller Paul Williams house, and and and. It hadn't been particularly well cared for and was in a state of disrepair and, and the client really wanted to tear it down. And so we were going to do, you know, a modern, I use the word modern house and, and it was nominated for conservancy protection shortly after. Ah, and and okay. so the surprise was that we weren't going to tear we it down. Right. Yeah, we couldn't tear it down. And so I had this really warm, fun experience working with, with, this fabulous bone structure and house that Paul had created. It was a little bit like Paul, you know, the one in the, the little cottage that was there in Amagansett. Yeah, sure, sure. You, you know how there was a little teeny thing that was, right. and to me that was just the spiritual seed, you know, right. that needed to be fertilized and watered. And wanted to do a larger, more elaborate house that did not violate the spirit of the original structure. Exactly, exactly. And so, um, and so we ended up having this very different journey with that project right. than we had started off thinking. And I, I love the project. I think it, it really well, kind that's of- that's especially good because now you don't have to be remembered in history as the guy who tore down a Paul Williams house. Totally. Which uh -huh. would not have helped your reputation any. Yeah. No. So no, no, just, no. As, just as well that all turned out, I would I, say. I agree completely. I, I see, good. Um, there's a related and equally interesting question. Uh, the houses in the book, of course, have all been built because that's all photography of extant things. They embody everything you and Paul say good architecture embodies. That's nice. What has caused you to turn down some commissions for houses? Have you turned some down? And if so, why? Yeah, um, it's usually one of two reasons. It's either, it's, you know, there's, there's only a finite amount of time, you know, right. and, and time management becomes a constraint, you know, sure. not surprisingly, right? Uh, and, and, and I'd rather have fewer projects that I can really 
get Put people involved. In. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and so we've got a pretty bespoke operation that, that doesn't, you know, have a ton of people. I think between our Seattle office and LA office, there's a total of 20, 22 people, something like that. I mean, you're not a factory churning out stuff yeah. at high volume. Yeah. And right. I, I, w I wish I, I wish I had a, the skill set to be more, you know, that and, and crank out more volume of high end, you know, beautiful projects. But I, I just, I don't. I, yeah, I mean, but you know, there's a point at which you, if you did, you wouldn't. In other words, you know, uh, there's a certain kind of work that I think can't be done at high volume. Yeah. In the same way that, you know, in, in, the, in the food industry, restaurant industry, you know, if you're going to serve banquets for uh, a thousand people at the Beverly Hilton, then you're not going to be able to turn out the kind of food that gets three Michelin stars. You know, right. you just, I mean, they, they, they just, there's certain things you just cannot produce at vast scale, I think. And, yeah. and certainly your houses require really intense involvement with the client. Yeah, are, absolutely. All, our, all residential architects who are any good become as involved with their clients as a therapist does, maybe more oh, so. Totally. I, I always say that, that for an architect, there's a fine line between being the gardener and a family member. Yeah, right, right, absolutely. You're yeah, somewhere yeah. in the middle, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yes. You're, still, you're still getting, yeah, you're, you're still an employee in the sense they write checks to you. Right. But you have right. an intimate connection that the gardener doesn't. Right. That, that, that's absolutely right. But now- You're also a psychologist, I think. Yes, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And you end up knowing intimate details about people that, that, you know, when you know what's in their closet and how many pairs of shoes they want to have, you know yeah. a lot about them. Yeah. But um, the, the other- You ever turned down houses because you didn't feel you would enjoy the relationship with the client? Yeah. Yeah, and I was just going to say, in answer to the the, the participants' question, yeah. um, which is a great question, I I, I feel like I I always say I, I feel like I get compensated three ways. One one is the money you get paid. The other is is the creative quality of what you're allowed to do, right. and the third is the quality of the relationship that you're servicing. Yeah, because you know, as we get older, we realize the journey is finite, and and you right. want to spend it with people that you really enjoy having on the path with you. And I, you know, some of my dearest, closest friends are former clients, you know, that, that are like family. The guy who's marrying me and Kellen, we had to push back our wedding until next year, supposed to be this December, uh, is, is a former client who I did a house for 15 years ago That's for his wife, you know, I mean, yeah. they're our best friends. And so, uh, that 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 relationship component, I think perhaps, probably more with residential than other. Oh, I think so. I think yeah. absolutely. Yeah. But you know, you're you're lucky that you can you have enough potential clients to be able to make the choice of working with the people who you care about and you feel you can have a real relationship with, which is great. Yeah. I mean, that, yeah. That's one of the great luxuries of all. I, I agree. Yeah. I totally agree. Yeah. Sharing the the path with the right folks. Exactly. And that stimulates you further to do your best work, right? Yeah. I mean, you, you, yeah. It's very hard to produce your best work for somebody you don't like or respect, no matter how big their checkbook is. I would think. That's right. So, for sure. For sure. Um, there's another question. Uh, if this is the first volume in a series, are there subsequent books? How are they coming along? Are there projects that you want to include in future books? You well, continuing to go beyond this one. Yes, I, I would love to do additional books. Uh, the, 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 it takes a while, so, so don't expect it next, next year, but, <laughs> but um, as Lynn will attest. But uh, we, we have quite a few projects in the pipeline. I think we have at the moment four international projects and eight domestic projects active. And so um, hopefully we won't have to wait another 20 years It'll be something shorter than that. And, um, and then hopefully we'll, we'll be able to, Paul, as you alluded to, branch out a little from just uh, houses and explore some other programs. Because the, the intellectual challenge of doing new stuff, I would think, yeah. is, is important to you. Totally. Yeah. I mean, you don't, 
another thing I like about this book is that it shows um, breadth and change among within the various projects, and yet there also are common threads that unite them. In other words, you know, they're not, you couldn't look at these eight houses and think eight different architects designed them. You know, there's, I mean, there, there are still things that mark your work that create a sense of continuity, and yet there's still a huge amount of variation and range within them as you respond to particular sites and programs and different people, different clients and so forth. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's, 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 that's wonderful. Um, here's another question. Um, what effects will COVID have on your future work? That is a great question. And, and I think uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting subject that all of us in, in the business are thinking about and, and all of us uh, in, in the world are thinking about, you know, how do we live and, and what are the fundamental paradigm shifts that are going right. to resonate from this experience? And I, I think we've all, uh, as a community, uh, globally, come to the realization that the home is a very important place for, uh, for, for not just the program of dwelling, but also now the program of uh, working and, and the program of uh, maintaining our health with fitness, you know, spaces for, for exercise and uh, all the components critical to having a balanced life. Um, I think a lot of that really will, will resonate. One of, my, one of my new clients who I just adore is one of the largest home builders in the country. And um, he was explaining the other day, uh, we were together and he was explaining how, you know, that, that fundamental shift is something that they're even thinking about in, in these companies that make, you know, 50 or 70,000 houses a, a year. And it's really going to affect, we think, the, the landscape of the American house and probably the world. Well, that's going to be an interesting que question, I think, because what that guy is doing is trying to bring these things into the mass market. I mean, most of the clients of the houses that you've done that are shown in this book all have workspaces, exercise spaces, all these other things because they are large, elaborate houses. Yeah. Lots of square feet done by people with substantial budgets um, yeah. who could afford to do those things long before COVID just because they were nice ideas, not necessities. And now we're facing really the much more difficult challenge of how do you make these things accessible right in smaller houses that are done on you know tighter budgets not for people of vast means doing bespoke houses right and that's a tough challenge really it is. you're right yeah. I, I think uh, even though none of us knows for sure what the long-term impact of covid will be we certainly know that it will have impact and this will probably be a huge part of it. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we hope, if we hope there's a, a way, a way to find it. Um, one, uh, we have time for just one, one more um, and it's somewhat related, but not directly to the COVID question, which is sustainability. Uh, mm -hmm. How important is that to you? How do you incorporate that into your work? Yeah, I think it's I think it's absolutely critical. I don't think it's a choice that 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 we that we really have any longer right. in in the world. You know, I mean, we have to be realistic that that we haven't been particularly good shepherds of our world, and we've right. kind of stuck our heads in the sand for 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 our whole historical existence. You know, and and we can't really do that anymore. And so, um, you know, looking at how we can uh, First, clean up a bit of the mess that perhaps we've made. That's one way that we can, in architecture, um, make a contribution in the right direction. And then, and then the other is sustainability with, uh, with energy and looking at how the materials that we select um, need to, for example, the, the wood, which we use quite a bit, you know, must come from managed forestry practices, you know, and not just tear down old growth trees for the sake of um, our, our vanity. Right. Um, and so, uh, I think it's a really critical 
thing that we, we all must embrace and, and take seriously. Is that something that all of your clients agree with? And do you, do you push them in that direction if they don't? For example, you know, given that many of your houses are designed with very substantial budgets, um, there's certainly not always a concern when people have that kind of means about short, you know, long-term expenses or about whether you use local materials versus others and so forth. Do you, do you try to educate your clients in that direction, even when there's not a financial incentive to do so? Yeah. You, you know, Paul, I haven't really, I haven't really had to. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's something that, and, and I'm, I'm sure, you know, this is just, uh, it's not true of everybody that I would come across, but for the most part, my clients are, are, are all on board with this, right. you know, um, and, 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 and they often will bring it up and Good. which is fabulous, you know? Um, so that's, that's encouraging. Yeah, absolutely. Good, good. I think that's a wrap. We're just about out of time. We are. Right. I can't believe an hour flew by. Thank you, everybody, for listening in out there. I hope we didn't uh, put you to sleep, and, and, and hopefully you use this as an excuse to get in out of the heat. I hear you guys right, are happy. Right. No, no, no. This is, this is summer, right. Uh, once again, Scott Mitchell Houses, a, an exceptionally beautiful book about exceptionally beautiful work. Um, and uh, I urge you all to, if you are not in a position to commission a Scott M Mitchell house, you can at least buy the Scott Mitchell book. And yes. Experience it that way. Um, yeah. Thank yeah. you so much, Lynn, for putting everything together, including the book. Thank you, Scott and Lynn, both for being here and for making this book happen. Thank you for your contribution. Thank you so much. And thank you um, to Bookhampton as well for hosting. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, again, Scott Mitchell Houses. Um, we have links available uh, to purchase in the chat box. Um, thank you, Scott, Lynn, and Paul, all for being here and for all of you um, for joining us this, this late afternoon. So I hope you enjoy the rest of your Sunday okay. and have a lovely, lovely day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Take care.